they've just stopped that event. So they debase currency to erode the debt, make the interest payments, because if not, they'd never be able to pay the interest because you'd eat up all of GDP growth just to pay this interest because it's 100% of GDP. And they stop the big bad event. So what that gives you is the greatest macro risk-taking opportunity of all time. doesn't mean the business cycle's gone, but overall, you've got the best risk-taking cycle in history. In this follow-up interview from The Julia LaRoche Show with Raul Pal, we dive deeper into the potential for exponential growth in Bitcoin, tech stocks, and other assets. Pal elaborates on how Bitcoin has been one of the top performing assets due to its ability to thrive in an environment with growing liquidity. At the time of this discussion, Bitcoin is trading around $63,000, with a 3% decrease in the last 24 hours and a 1% decrease in the last 7 days. Before we dive further into these insights, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this channel. Now, let's hear from Raul Pal about what's coming next for Bitcoin. Well, we've talked about the Fed put for years, but we didn't really right. understand what it meant. What it is for is, listen, if you've got a lot of debt, your collateral is what you pledge against the debt, right? The whole system is built on this. That's what blew up in 2008 because the house prices went down and everyone's loans were this high. But if you think of the whole system, all the banks and all the asset management firms and all the leverage and all the private equity and all of the stuff, they don't want the equity to go down because that's the collateral. They can, they allowed the bond market to go down because in the end it gets repaid. So it's a mark to market loss. But in equities, when you've got this massive retirement system, you just don't want that. So this Fed put is part of the everything code. And I didn't really realize it, but it's actually been going since 2010. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really see it. But now it's so clear that yeah. all the central banks understand what they're doing. They understand the entire game. They understand that they need to monetize the interest payments. Really, since 2012, it's, it's super picked up. And we would not have had a recession were it not for COVID because they've basically made it very difficult to happen. Because if you think of recessions, they're driven by the credit cycle mainly. And if you don't like if you don't want credit markets to get stressed, then you don't have recessions. So generally speaking, as I said, crypto markets tend to go bananas. So that is, you know, we're talking currently the, the total market cap of crypto is about $2 trillion. By the end of this cycle, it'll be at 10 to 15 trillion. I mean, that's la la land returns. I mean, but that's crypto. Crypto gives that kind of opportunity. Uh, the NASDAQ's been following this perfectly. So it just keeps going, whether we get another 20%, 50% upside in the NASDAQ, or it could be more. We don't know. You can't really tell. But the point being is the gains are huge. We'll also see commodities picking up. We'll also see, you know, we've seen precious metals picking up. We'll see all parts of the economy and the stocks picking up as the economy's growing. Inflation's not yet a problem. And um, the central banks are cutting rates and adding liquidity to finance their debts. That's utopia. That's what crypto uh, macro summer and macro fall. It's basically market utopia. Wait. Half of Twitter is still fighting about a recession. Okay, and I was going to. The gonna... world's going to end and geopolitics. Okay, let's explore that. I got to. As we just heard Raul Pal explain, liquidity plays a crucial role in driving asset prices. And now he shifts focus to Bitcoin's extraordinary performance in recent years. With Bitcoin's historical ability to outperform all other assets, Pal shares how central bank rate cuts and liquidity injections could further fuel Bitcoin's rise. He emphasizes Bitcoin's scarcity, decentralized nature, and resilience in turbulent markets, making it a critical asset for risk takers in the current macro environment. This period is ripe for significant market gains, and Bitcoin stands at the forefront of this opportunity. Now, let's hear more from Raul Pal. People, uh, there's a large group of people who want their justice. They want the system to fall apart, to say, I told you so. You're printing money, you're creating inflation, you're doing this. It's all unsustainable. And they don't want to see that what's actually happening, this 8% debasement, is basically all of us being charged 8% for a put option on the system, which is actually maybe not that bad, but they don't want to see it. And then a lot of people who aren't invested in technology can't stand the fact that it outperforms versus what was deemed to be the right way to invest, which was the, the um, value investor, the cyclical commodity, deep value, that thing. And that's not been working for 30 years. But yet, 
they want it to come back. So they get more angry as markets go, and then they start drawing patterns about how it's going to crash. Well, markets, A, unlikely to crash unless it's further out the risk curve. But markets don't crash when the business cycle's picking up. They crash when the business cycle is slowing down, and let's say the ISM crosses 50. It never happens at this point of the cycle. So really, there's no real rational argument. And the Fed are cutting rates now. They're pushing liquidity into the system. The market's buoyant, and the ISM is going to start picking up all the forward-looking indicators are. So it's really difficult to argue that there's a bubble and it's going to pop. And when we get to the bubble argument, something else they miss is they look at price earnings and they say, see, price earnings keep going up there. It's getting wildly expensive. But price and earnings, if you remember the story of your earnings and house prices, house prices are always going up more than your earnings. Well, what is price earnings? It's the share price, which is driven by debasement, and corporate earnings, which are driven by GDP growth. So over time, as we add liquidity into the system, the everything code suggests that price earnings will keep going higher because of this dynamic, but people don't understand it. So they look to a world of the past. Now, this has actually all been done before. This is not a brand new thing. After World War II, this is what they did. They used yield curve control as a way of stimulating the economy, and they, they essentially grew their way out of it by refinancing the debts. And we had exactly the same four-year cycle back from about 1948 to about 1968. So we had 20 years of it back then. This is the 1970s gold-owning, value-investing inflationists who think this is the case. The US bond market can't completely fall apart. Why? Because you can print money and buy it. So that doesn't happen. The currency could weaken, but the rest of the world is even worse. So I'm not sure where this inflation, this mystical, magical, long-term structural, the 70s are coming back, when you've got an aging population, um, you've got low productivity, and you've got a an accelerated technological revolution, including AI, plus high debts. It's almost impossible to generate sustained inflation, which is why China can't generate it, Japan can't generate it, Europe can't generate it, and the US can't generate it either. Rates were, were at five and a half percent. Inflation was at two and a half. I mean, that, that's 300 basis points of tight interest rates. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Look at people's mortgages. Look at house, uh, look at car purchases. Nobody could get access to credit. Look at credit card rates. It was too restrictive for the economy. Mm -hmm. And they need to cut it because they also need to roll their interest payments and they need to refi their debts at lower rates. Moving rates as high as they did was necessary to stop that pervasive idea that inflation was going to be sticky because inflation can be a mindset shift. You know, mm -hmm. we saw corporations after corporations just raise prices, raise prices, raise prices. And what this did was slow all of that down. So, no, I don't think it was a mistake. I don't think a Federal Reserve did a very bad job. It's, nobody likes going through a rate cycle like that. This is the largest of all of our lifetimes. And so, therefore, it's pretty ugly. It doesn't feel good. Nobody likes it. Business slows down for everybody. But it worked in terms of getting rid of inflation and any expectations of future inflation. So inflation expectations have collapsed in the US now. In fact, where are they today? So a five-year break-even are at 2% and one year are at 90 basis points. So there's nobody's expecting inflation because the Fed did a good job. Now they need to bring rates lower and they have to bring it a lot lower. You know, I still think rates come down to two, two and a half. To watch the full interview, check out the link in the description. In this discussion, Raoul Powell goes into how central banks' liquidity injections and interest rate cuts are driving major opportunities for Bitcoin and other risk assets. He also outlines the unprecedented macro setup that could create massive gains in the coming years. We would love to hear your thoughts on some questions. Will Bitcoin continue to lead as a high-return asset in this evolving landscape? How do you think central bank policies will shape the future of decentralized finance? Thank you for tuning in to Only the Savvy. If you enjoyed this discussion, please subscribe, like, and share our video for more engaging content exploring the innovative world of decentralized finance and technologies.